Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for braving the weather to be here today. And for those who are on the web, the same thing. I think there's rain all over California. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. This is the, the I for Energy Research Exchange. We have one more lecture. Next week will be our last lecture of the fall semester. So thank you for attending. Uh, well, I will introduce our speaker. Alberto Selpa is an assistant professor and founding faculty at UC Merced. He received a PhD in computer science from UCLA in 2005, a master's of science degree in computer science from USC in 2000, master's of science in electrical engineering from USC in 1998, and the engineering degree in electrical engineering from Buenos Aires Institute of Technology, Argentina in 1995. His interests lie broadly in the computer networking and distributed systems areas. His recent focus has been on systems research in wireless sensor networks with emphasis on network self-configuration, radio channel, channel measurement and characterization, programming models, and development of wireless test beds. Dr. Serpa applies sensor network technology to a wide range of application domains, including building energy management, solar radiation mapping and control for solar energy generation, exercise physiology monitoring and modeling, among others. So join me in welcoming Dr. Serpa. Thank you so much. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about uh, basically an application that is human in the loop. I work with a lot of nodes and a lot of, with a lot of technology, uh, different type of sensors. I have worked with magnetometers, accelerometers, you know, different humidity radiation sensors. But for this application that we developed with my grad student, Barry Erickson, we actually use a human as a sensor. So it's a little different from almost everything I have done in the past. So first I want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, Citrus, who provided seed funding for this project uh, and has been super supportive of all my work in the energy domain. Uh, have collaborated in the past with a lot of people from ETRC, Berkeley Lab. Uh, this particular project is you know, being you know, led by Varry Erickson, who is my PhD student. So simple introduction. You know, buildings are a very important component in terms of you know, the energy matrix. Basically, if you consider that the US takes 20% of the worldwide energy consumption, total energy, on all the forms, uh, the buildings actually form the major part of that pie. Uh, almost 40%, or more than 40%, it's energy consuming buildings. So think about this, it's like 8% worldwide energy consumptions only in the buildings in the US. Uh, the dominant component within that frame is the HVAC that accounts for 43% of that. So we're talking about mastodonic numbers uh, when you actually translate that into a, a dollar figure. Of that 43%, 23% is spent in heating, 14% in cooling, 6% in ventilation. The other important factors are lighting and electronic computers, the load that you have you know, attached to the system. So. People have tried to do a lot of energy savings in buildings by basically trying to handle the load. And the load in this case is basically uh, how you control the HVAC system with respect to the performance that you provide to the users that are using the building. People have tried to do, you know, optimize use of the economizer, demand response ventilation, occupancy-based conditioning. We have worked a lot in these two areas. And usually the strategies are user-centric, mostly because the quality of service that you're providing in the building has to be centered around providing conditioning to the users of the building. So we have worked a lot on trying to detect the patterns of human moving within the buildings. What we did is in an unintrusive way, we deployed over the science and engineering one building at UC Merced, a system as well as cameras. Uh, it's basically uh, a very low power consumption camera attached to one of the nodes with a door peephole that is only $5. It's a prototype. Uh, but it allows us to basically detect the transition of people like an optical turnstile. And using that pattern, we know in real time what is the distribution of people. Uh, this is not enough knowing in real time, basically, because the control and the actuation that you're trying to do uh, is not enough to be reactive. You have to predict the movement of people in order to precondition the rooms in order for this to be successful. So we have published a lot of you know, uh, work on this, and I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to mention that this is a technology that does exist, at least in our campus. So the other side of the coin 
is how about comfort? Uh, so many other people have also worked in energy efficiency, but the main problem is that they usually ignore the human. Exactly, you, we are having, you know, we are having HVAC system, we're conditioning the buildings just so humans are comfortable. And usually in all these studies, we ignore them. We try to scavenge and we try to, you know, save the last penny of energy, but in the end, we don't know really if the occupants are being comfortable or not. So if we ignore comfort in the optimization equation, the main problem is it's a ludicrous, you know, problem to solve because in order to, if you just want to minimize energy consumption, you just shut down the building. Turn off all the lights, the heating and the cooling, that maximizes energy savings. So the other side of the equation has to be considered. So the goal here is by using humans as sensors, we develop a user-driven system to continuously adjust temperatures. We use previous model of thermal comfort with occupant feedback to make more precise adjustments. And then we examine two different strategies of utilizing you know, the occupant feedback. And finally, we examine how adjusting the thermal comfort of occupants actually affects energy consumption. So the first thing we faced was, well, how many people here know what is their own optimal temperature in order to be comfortable? Are you sure about that? Just based on empirical uh, experience from my own home. Okay. I'm comfortable in the winter at 67 degrees. Okay. So <coughs> you know that particular rooms and your home very well, but are you always wearing the same clothes? Okay, and uh, because you have a controlled regime inside, external factors like humidity, et cetera, do not affect the temperature? Um, it would. It would, but again, I, 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 <coughs> my empirical experience is just like heating. In the summer, it's a completely different story. <laughs> so what happened is that we ask a lot of people through surveys, please give us your optimal temperature, the one that you know and you know yourself that you feel very comfortable. And basically, this is the range of responses we get. Kind of a bell-shaped distribution with some people in the extremes. I don't know how but, or why, but there are people, you know. <laughs> so from the survey, we know, OK, so people seem to be. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So we have basically, in a production building, uh, some of these data is for 39 people. Right now, we have a population of 100 people. Uh, so there are mixed results here because this is ongoing work. Uh, and this is a production building. This is not just grad students, but also staff people, people that actually work in the building. This is a real production building. So this is what people like, 69, majority of the people. Now, when we actually use a system that provides feedback to the users, what we get is around this area. So even though people are absolutely convinced that they know what the temperature is in practice, when they vote in their own interest, that changes. Which leads us to believe, well, sometimes, even though you may believe that you're absolutely sure that you know what temperature you like, sometimes this is false. So what is comfortable? Well, it truly really depends on the conditions. Humidity, temperature, independence, a lot of factors. Uh, it is somewhat subjective because even under the same conditions, different people may have a different experiences. And each person has different temperature preference. So how do we ensure that everyone is happy in order to basically minimize misery? Because we like optimization. So the standard, the gold standard in building metric has always been PMV. Since the 70s, you know, Fanger developed the predictive mean vote. It is, oops, it is already incorporated into uh, the ASTRA standard 55 of building conditioning uh, is basically a simple continuous scale from minus three to three, being minus three, very cold, three, hot, and then all these different gradients in between. The goal, the ideal, is to have a PMV of zero because that would indicate that the perfect, is the perfect temperature, is the perfect condition, and the person is actually comfortable. Now, when you actually take a look at the PMV, it has many, many parameters. It has air temperature, 
relative humidity, mean radiant temperature, partial water, you know, vapor pressure, air velocity, metabolism, external work. Metabolism is basically the minimum amount of energy you need to live to exist, breathe, to move. And the external work is, well, in addition to that, you might be walking or you might be sitting, you might be doing something else. Closing coefficient. Are you wearing a sweater or not, et cetera. So you have this formula with all these parameters, and you want to make it equal to zero in order to find what is the optimal temperature for any particular room or any particular zone. So what happened in practice is that usually you can measure the air temperature. You have instrumented sensors. And you can also measure and even control humidity if you want to. Sometimes it's very expensive. Sometimes you don't have control of that. Now, all the other parameters are usually not measured or controlled. And that is a problem, because even though the PMB metric per se, with all these right parameters, might be fantastic, the problem is that you seldom ever have access to the right parameters in any particular area. So it's a big, long formula. I'm not going to get into that. So it's a big, ugly formula. And basically, the output is something that goes from minus 3, 3 continues, with all these parameters. So if you want to optimally set the room temperature, the ideal building energy manager would like to calculate this equation, put P and V equal to 0. So the first thing is you need to estimate the parameters that are very hard to measure. So what do you do? You put some values that seem reasonable. The step two is you solve T for the big ugly formula. So you put all these values there, and you solve for T equals 0. And that is the ideal temperature. Now, the problem is, because you're estimating the parameters and you're not actually measuring them, slight variations in the parameters provide different results in the temperature. And you may believe that 2 degrees is not a lot, but for humans that perceive that, it's a tremendous difference. So depending on which specific parameters you estimate, you're going to get a completely different result. There is a lot of sensibility with respect to the parameters. So, and the comfortable temperature depends on the estimated parameters. So, which room temperature is right is the main question because it basically, uh, there's a lot of hand waving here. You cannot measure, you have this formula, but you cannot use it. So, there are many different, you know, limitations because of this. Many parameters are impractical to measure and some of them really cannot be measured. Like, how do you measure dynamically the clothing of people or the metabolic rate? It's just truly, truly complicated. Parameters are given you know, fixed values, and this leads to errors in occupant discomfort. So it's very complicated for energy managers to actually calculate that, and they hate that. They actually don't use it. So what do energy managers do? The guys that are actually running the buildings, these guys that are consuming 40% of the energy in the US. Well, it's a complaint-driven process. What they do is, they pick a temperature that seems reasonable for them, and they hope there are no complaints. If there are complaints, they repeat. Because they, even if there are complaints, they don't know what to do. So they change it. They change it in some direction. It's like random walk. This is what really happened in practice, in majority of the buildings. So what we propose here is something slightly different. We, why don't we ask the occupants? The users input how they feel. We adjust the temperature based on the input, we repeat. There is no better sensor to sense how you're feeling than yourself. So why don't we use that? So we you know, develop Thermovote, which is a combined application through websites and also cell phone applications in Android and in iPhone. You can download them down. They're in the market. Just search for Thermovote. Uh, and basically, you have a, a bunch of rooms. And you have a scale, exactly the same scale as ASRI. And you, at any point in time, you can vote. And you vote how you feel. So instead of having a dial in which you can actually set a particular temperature that you really don't know what you want, you are going to feedback how you feel. So this has been, this is kind of old because now we have extended this. But at the time, we have 39 participants in seven different zones. You know, it's a complicated thing because it's human subject. You have to go through IRB and all these things. It's a, it's a very similar building to this one, except that it has actually has a, a lot of you know, dry spaces and wet labs. So it has actually two BMS systems 
working in parallel, and it's a little bit more complicated. You have ALC for the offices and Phoenix system for the wet labs. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more details if you want to later on. So, and, and some of these zones are in one of the systems, some of the other zones are, this is, for instance, the Dean suite. Uh, so it has to work, otherwise I get out of a job very, very fast. <laughs> so the users you know, provide basically votes in that scale, call to HUD regarding how they feel, and the user have one vote every 10 minutes. And the resubmittal is allowed. You, you're allowed to change your mind. Every 10 minutes we tally the votes, and we check what the users want. And the votes are also average on each zone, because what happens is that multiple people may be working in the same zone, right? So the main problem we faced at the beginning was, OK, imagine people are voting cold. Fine, what do you do? How cold is cold? What do you need to do? So if a person stayed I'm cold, how much should the temperature change? So what we try to do is, well, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, at least for now. So let's use what we have available. And the nice model that people have developed is PMV. So let's reuse that. So in order to determine how much we adjust the temperature, we use the well-known model PMB. So PMB is inherently error-prone since multiple parameters are still estimated. So you know that you're still going to have an error. So by using the actual mean vote, which is the tally of the votes of people voting, front term of vote, we can correct the PMB error using a temperature adjustment. So it's very simple. We add an offset, and we make the two equal. Now we calculate the offset from the theoretical one with all the errors that are still estimated, and what people actually want. And using that offset, we know the direction and the range in which we need to adjust the temperature. The intuition is, how much do we need to adjust the PMB in order for our estimate to match A and B, which is what really people want. So by solving, by solving for the offset, we can determine that. Super simple. So we try two different control strategies. So remember, this is live experiments on a real building. So, and we try to because we recognize that not all the buildings are new, modern, and have very capable BMS systems. There are a lot of historical buildings, buildings that are old, buildings that you basically have one knob, have one static scheduler, and you have these big you know, devices that perhaps you can do, you know, change once or twice a day, that's it. That's the best you can do. So we wanted somehow to attack that problem as well. So we wanted to find a schedule, a static schedule, uh, where the real-time control is not available. So we wanted to learn how people react and feel based on a particular you know, period of time, a week, a month, etc. And then based on that learned information, try to set up a schedule on how to change the temperatures daily. So we calculate the A and B every 10 minutes interval, and we calculate the offsets of the adjustment based on a model. And then based on that, we can predict what people may want. And then we try to control the building based on that model. So assumes, obviously, that the T-offset does not vary from day to day, which is actually wrong. Uh, if you have years and years of data, you can understand the seasonality of the data. You have many different buildings and many different transition patterns. You may end up learning that. But we don't have enough data yet. So this is why it doesn't really work. And we, we also have the real time, which is real time control available. Based on the instantaneous A and B, we can control what people want. And the T offset is calculated on the fly based on the votes. So we run, we have also a much longer study that is now almost a year. But in this presentation, I'm presenting the published results, which are the first study we run a baseline, which is a very optimal study schedule that has been set up with feedback information from users depending on when they work and what are the temperatures that they prefer. And this is a, 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 you know, a lead gold certified building. So it's a very efficient building. So I'm just telling you that the baseline is not really bad. It's actually probably better than most of the buildings you're going to see you know, in the market. Uh, and it has been done, it was done by uh, the energy, the energy manager was, you know, before, you know, John Elliott, a very capable person, and now work at LBNL, and uh, it was the best you can do, basically. Then the learn schedule, we run it for a week, and then a real time for three weeks, and we do comparisons. 
And then we run a second study on a long-term real time for five months. So these are some of the results. On the x-axis, you see a sample of a week. And on the y-axis, you see the PMD scale. So you see how people are voting at any point in time. This is for a particular office zone. And then you see the correction factor for the PMB estimate, which is, this is the original PMB estimate. The conditions are changing because of the dynamics of the temperature of daily. So even if you are aiming for a PMB zero, the system you know, takes inertia to react, so you're always gonna be deviating. In addition, you know, the standard control of PMB is oscill in, 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 in the buildings are oscillating constantly around the temperature set point, so it's never perfect. So you're gonna see some variability there. But this is basically the offset that we calculate because this should be the corrected estimate. And when we run it with the learn schedule, we see that it's roughly around the center. So we learn from the previous patterns. When we run these experiments, the weather and the external conditions were similar. So we, it was you know, good for basis of comparison. This was done in, this was done in the spring. It's uh, Central Valley, California. You see Merced. So something like one hour north of Fresno, if you want a geographical reference. Two hours from here. So you see that the total number of votes changes with the learn schedule, but sometimes you get it very wrong. And people also, in some days, get very, very discomfort and they vote that they are very cold. Now. When we try the real-time system, we see that the frequency of voting has changed. And it gets reduced because with real-time, there are some corrections at the beginning, but then immediately the system adjusts. With very few, with much fewer correction, people are much happier because you can adjust basically on what the real users want. Now, people argue at the point, well, this might be a novelty factor. People were excited because now they have a knob and they're gonna start using it. But then after a while, you know, it's a fade and people are gonna stop using it. And it's true. So what we did is we wanted to run long-term studies. And what, what we discovered is it is true. At the beginning, there is a lot of excitement, but at the, very, at the same time, there's a lot of learning going on of what really people want. So there's a lot of variability in the temperatures and adjusting and all that. And then you get to a plateau, but you always get some background voting because you always have this notion that you constantly need to adjust. You're never really perfect. Our long-term goal is that the system with enough data would learn so much that would require less and less input from the users. It will really learn. And then when there is an event like there is a change, I drop a wall or something like that, there is a change in the zone, or you know, people move to other you know, locations and they have different preferences, the system will constantly be relearning. So, some of the interesting things that we discover about you know, the user behavior. <clears throat> so people are really good at figuring out if they're comfortable. And when they're comfortable, they vote very little and they say, well, I'm neutral, I'm fine, I don't need a lot of deviation. So whenever they're comfortable, they know that and they immediately provide feedback and they don't need to vote a lot. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to understand when people are, have experiences in discomfort because different people experience discomfort very differently. And the problem is that depending on who is voting, it may be cool or slightly cool, so the slight difference that happens truly depends on who is voting. We haven't done kind of the demographic analysis about exactly who is voting, if that a female or a male, Depending on the position, we have done analysis in terms of position with respect to the distance to the VAV, the distribution of the furniture inside the room, because there are a lot of these factors that can contribute. Yes? <coughs> well, actually, there are multiple, but because this is an aggregated over a week, you cannot say it. But there are, uh, in the, the, the voting pattern truly depends on the person. So when we deploy the system, in the first week that we were running baseline, but we were learning the patterns, we asked some people, vote because it's in your best interest. And there was one person that voted every 10 minutes, every day of the week. 
fantastic data set, was you know, really, really committed because he has complained a lot with facilities. No one cared. He was very uncomfortable in his office. He wanted to make absolutely sure that people would consider his input. Um, did you measure his productivity? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> it's privacy invasion. <laughs> Not that I don't want to, but. <clears throat> so, but in any case, uh, so different people vote differently. So the pattern of voting is different in terms of the total number of votes, et cetera. And these things evolve over time. So in this case, in this figure, many of the thick lines are actually multiple votes that happen to be the same. So the density is Correct. The the yes, yes. Any more questions? So, well, in the application, well, we change it, actually. So, Ed Aarons, actually, we put it comfortable and say, well, it should be neutral, because that's what the standard said. But whenever we actually talk to users, they hate neutral. Because what is, what is neutral? It's like I don't feel anything. So, they find it much more meaningful to be comfortable. So, in the ACLA application, I think we ended up putting comfortable there. And this was basically because people like it that way. And they really didn't understand that. Because we have to go through the IRB protocol. We have to do a one one-on-one session explaining the system and explaining all the things. And this is the feedback that we got in our population. So in the end, in practice, we know this is not what the standard says. And when we present the course, we put neutral because it's the scale. But in the actual application, we use the word comfortable. We change it. So the, the other thing, though, is that even if the user makes a mistake, or even if this is not clear, the system is designed to be continuously with feedback. So if you are not going in the right direction, the user will let you know. So you will self-correct, no matter what. So it is better to have a scale that actually provides better understanding, so it's less confusing, I think. So it's worth investigating. But I'm just saying that this is not a one-time stop, because eventually you'll self-correct. Yes. You don't have to vote. Mm -hmm. You vote whenever you want. There are people that vote only once a day. Correct. But, but I think effectively what you're saying, this is how the system works. People, some people, in particular when we went into the learning phase, they wanted the system to learn that they were comfortable. So they voted neutral. But over a daily basis, over many, many months, people don't really vote comfortable. If they're comfortable, they just don't vote. So in that model, then, if, if there's 100 people and one person uh, votes, then there's no one voting, will the system pull down to try to fix that person? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about that. That's a very important issue. Yeah. In particular, with rooms that are shared by multiple people, what do you do? Oh, yeah. You have only one control knob, multiple people with different preferences. What do you do? So that's a very, very important point. Yeah. Correct. 
Correct, correct. We have some preliminary results, although the real optimization happened when you consider both the comfort and the energy, and also external factors like you know, you know, ele you know elect gas and electricity price. If you go to a floating system that actually changes in real time, it makes a very, very interesting optimization problem, but this is kind of future work. But I'll, I'll have energy results as well here. So, where are we at? Okay, so the pattern of voting, even over long periods of time, continues. Some people, they, most people know when they are comfortable. People have different ideas of how, what is uncomfortable? What is the notion of discomfort? Now, exactly your question. The term of, you know, uh, fields. Some instances where people completely disagree on temperature. So, you're sharing your cubicle with another person. It's the same zone. I feel very hot. You feel very cold. So, this whole psychological game. And the problem with this that we have a very tricky population because in some of the zones that we experience, you know, experience this, this were a lot of computer science grad students that are expert in hacking and expert in trying to break the system and expert in doing, you know, they, they, perhaps they do research in game theory. So they are doing everything they can to, you know, make the system favor their own preferences. So we really, really stress the system and we need to make some adjustments and I'll explain some of them. So, what do you do when you have an extreme opposite? Imagine the worst case, two persons sharing an office. I feel extremely cold, I extreme, ex extremely hot. You have only one control surface, yeah. Yes, that's probably the only sensible solution. Almost like you need to basically actuate more at the finer granularity. There is no other. So, because we don't have that, although in the future you may end up having that, you know, there are a lot of people in building sciences that study, you know, can you hit it from below? Is the vertical error? Can you have the individualized cubicle in which I'm, you know, basically condition your own little space? Uh, the chairs, remember that I, people have done this, the chair that incorporate kind of a little AC device. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably uh, out of this, you're getting into policy issues, so I'm not going to touch that. I want to continue doing research in this area. Well, do you see strategic voting where instead of the normal curve, you see the normal curve with two spikes and two people trying to bias it that way? <coughs> we do. We do see that, and, and we're trying to exploit that. And what we are really after is try to build better models. Because if you can predict the voting pattern, or how people will feel comfortable depending on the conditions and depending on the past history, you can leverage that. First, to anticipate needs. And also, to play games in which how much do I need to tweak this in order to maximize the energy savings, while still not the user not complaining. So that's the name of the game. And this is what I'm looking at right now. Trying to you know, squeeze the last ounce of everything that I can. Now, let me tell you, though, there are users that are better than any temperature sensor I've ever seen. We were playing some of these games, and a variation, I'm not kidding, of 0 0.2, which is within the error of almost all standard temperature sensors, 0 0.2 you know, Fahrenheit, people immediately start calling us like, I'm voting, but it's not working. It's like, and, and I notice there is a temperature change. Amazing. We were trying to squeeze and try to see if we can save a little bit more energy, and there are some users that are super precise. Perfect thermostats, amazing. Other users not, so if you learn those, the picky users versus the one that you can play games, then you can exploit that. Now, you're getting very tricky because whenever I talk to my students, this is completely anonymized because it almost I feel like I'm playing Mengele. It's with temperature, I'm not being intrusive with the bodies, but it's a little bit like that. So you want to be super careful because there are policy issues, right, you know, invasion, et cetera. So just be, take into account that, you know, Policy consideration in terms of how you control and how you play these games also should be considered. So, <clears throat> occupants in general were very receptive and were extremely willing to participate. You know, physical feedback helps to, you know, with the buy-in into the system. It's, it's their own thermal, you know, welfare. So they really want to do it. Consistently used even over longer periods of time, 
right now we are close to a year of being used. And the occupants in areas with multiple occupants sometimes exaggerate their feeling. Because this is the bias that you get, gets introduced. Somehow you know that the other person is voting the other way, so I'm going to exaggerate my discomfort in the other direction so I can gain more. Typical game theory stuff. So very useful, oops, very useful for detecting breakdowns and reaction changes to the system. This is fantastic for HVAC fall detection. In fact, there was no better fall detection system. First of all, for our own system, for example, if a database is down, the system is not working, 20 minutes in, into that, immediately you start receiving calls of people like, I don't know what's going on, term of vote is not working. So obviously there was you know, a bug in our code or something, so we need to recover it. But sometimes we discover a lot of faults in the VAVs that were sometimes being there for years. And because you know, people start noticing that it's voting, but it's not, the system is not reacting adequately, and it's not changing the temperature fast enough, then we start doing you know, troubleshooting and discover, oh, there's a problem with the VAV. So it is actually very good. So using the feedback from the user gives you a fantastic diagnostic tool for the building itself, which is something that we discovered almost on the side, but it's probably worth investigating a little bit more. So we run a bunch of surveys about satisfaction, before and after and in between. So as you can see, the baseline, which again was on a lead gold certified building with static schedules that were defined by the users and with you know, input even on, on in, in terms of the temperature that they prefer, they were really dissatisfied, even though the users provided all that information. You know, large majority of the people were either dissatisfied completely or somewhat dissatisfied. Very few people were satisfied, yes. So this is what we're doing now. I don't have the results now. So it's a classic example of you know, interrupted time series. So we are doing all these hypotheses and analysis with a control group, with all these things, and intervening at different times. So, but I don't have the results. But we are doing that, yes. <coughs> I don't remember. But I can find out easily for you if you really want to know. My student would probably know because he, you know, uh, actually draw the survey. We ran the survey though with Ed Ahrens and a bunch of people here because we wanted to make sure that we were asking the right questions, et cetera. And we talked to a lot of cognitive psychologists and all that as well. Because you know, human subjects are computer scientists, unless you work in computer human interaction and all that, it's not something that is your day-to-day -day basis. So we were learning a lot. So we were always running all the surveys, et cetera, by people that really do a lot of human subjects and know what they're doing. So on the long term, on, on, on the short term, Perhaps because of the effect of control, et cetera, the satisfaction was hardly 100%. There were people, no people dissatisfied. It was fantastic. But then we thought, okay, how about the real term, long term? After five months, how do people experience that? And there were some people that were still dissatisfied, but the mass majority were satisfied. You see the change has been dramatic. Can you compare the energy use? Yes. I'm going to talk about that later. So, how about thermal comfort? <coughs> well, originally, people in the building, this was in the spring, so it's still hot in Merced. And basically, the building is, I think it's overventilated, and it's very, very cold in many, many rooms. And the reason why sometimes this happens, and it happens with a lot of buildings. I go to Silicon Valley to startups, and you go to the conference room, and it's freezing. It's like, why are you doing that? And you're spending those, you know, so much energy doing that. Why? I feel uncomfortable now because it's so cold. And the problem is, when they design the building, you don't know, you don't have a system to measure real-time occupancy. So how do you control, how do you calculate the temperatures, etc. Usually, and how do you also calculate ventilation? You don't want to be below the minimum ventilation. If you don't have CO2 sensor, what do you do? So in order to play it safe, you play for maximum occupancy. Now, if you're playing for maximum occupancy, you're overventilating. In general, you tend to overdo it. So this is one of the things that we have discovered even with our previous work. So having an actual system that actually measured real-time you know, occupancy is very, very helpful. So this is a typical example. 
people were feeling really slightly cool, cold, or cool. Slightly warm, a few, and warm, very few. So 75% of the people or so were feeling cold, some level of cold. Now, in the long term, now majority of the people actually feel neutral, feel OK. There were still some people that were feeling slightly cool or cool or you know, cold or even warm or slightly warm. However, if you actually consider the satisfaction regime, that tells you that you don't need to achieve perfect temperature conditioning for everyone in order to have high levels of satisfaction. And I think it's an interesting point. Sure. Yes. No people vote. No, no, zero. Is uh, well, these results at the time we ran the population were around 50 people. Now we have a group of 100 people. This is the result of. Uh, multiple pre-surveys, middle surveys after the intervention, and post-surveys. Now, I may offer a different explanation in the following slides. Yes. Ah, exactly. Which word we use in the survey? I have to get back to you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, in the application, we definitely put comfortable there. In the survey question, I'm not sure. So the first thing is lack of complaints doesn't necessarily mean that people are satisfied. Because when we talk to facilities, we are trying to sell the system to facilities people, they say, well, Previous term of there were only four or five complaints per semester. So we're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> when we asked people, how do you feel, they were mostly dissatisfied. And they were showing the data, like, no, this is unbelievable because people don't complain. So what happened is that, obviously, well, you know, facility was not working that well in terms of the help desk and all these things. And they have a huge backlog of complaints. Complaints were not really being you know, taken care of. So people got tired. They get saturated quite fast. So it's easy to stop complaining if you see that people are not really doing anything after your complaint. So, and it's easy for facility managers to say, well, everything is peachy and everything is nice, because in the end, look at the log, no complaints. So it's nice to actually face them with reality. Uh, the actual satisfaction for baseline surveys you know, show low satisfaction. And the studies have shown that users who perceive that they have control more likely are to be satisfied, which is the effect that you mentioned. So this is well known since the 90s. So occupants are more willing to report a status to a device than to call or to email. So this is something also very useful. People may feel uncomfortable sending you know, 10 emails per day to a person or to a system. But voting on, on a phone, it's like, no, yeah, sure, I'll give you the info. Not a problem. It's, it's, it's a psychological aspect, but this is what we discovered. Now, the energy consumption question. So on the learn schedule, we actually slightly, and this is total energy. I have the breakdown here in terms of you know, the fun, the electricity, you know, the heat and the cooling the, done with gas, et cetera. I have the full breakdown. But it's almost the same as baseline, but it's 2% more. So we actually consume with the learn schedule, with the learn, you know, control strategy, which is we learn the patterns and then we apply that later on in the following week, we noticed a slight increase in energy consumption. And this is was because of overheating. We analyzed this and I can tell you exactly what happened. Now, with the real-time system, we actually discovered that we got 10% savings. Now, this was, after, this was an afterthought. We never really optimized the system in order to achieve the savings. This just happened, and it happened in that particular condition, in that particular building with those particular users. I'm not telling you every time you, you know, hit the users, you're always going to get savings. 
I can guarantee you you're going to get much better quality of service in one, in, in, with respect to the service you're providing to the users. I cannot guarantee you're going to provide savings in terms of energy. But in our case, we got 10% savings. Is this normalized rate? Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 this is normalized. normalized. Yes, yes. We even ran later on uh, with Energy Plus, we, ran, we, we wanted to extrapolate because if you want to try different control strategies and you really want to capture the seasonality of the data, you need to run each one for years with the same population. So you need five years of study, multiple, multiple different times. So what we did is we run interleaved. We try to find you know, different, uh, similar uh, weather patterns. And then what we, really, we, we, we uh, define a calibrated model in Energy Plus and we run yearly uh, simulations. <coughs> this is actual measurement. This is actual measurement, really, you know, taking a look at you know, the meters, the electricity, the whole thing. So then how is it normalized? The, the, the experimental data was done uh, with wicks that have the very, very similar weather patterns in terms of humidity and temperature and the variability. So I think the, the difference uh, in average was less than one Fahrenheit external. So it's not normalized, but it's not important. Well... No, 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 no. So it was very close, and then we adjust based on that temperature, based on an energy model. But the, the adjustment factor was very small because the conditions were already quite similar. But in addition, because we had a calibrated model, we run yearly simulations just to see how what would it affect the year wise. So the learned strategy used 2% more energy than baseline, and the real time strategy, less energy than that. 10%. But again, this is just a preliminary result. So one thing that we do not consider were the independent sources of conditioning. So for instance, in the, in the Dean suite, there were six people using space heaters because they were feeling very cold. And they were running these you know, guzzlers there that consume a lot of electricity. Even if they do duty cycles and the modern, et cetera, they consume a lot. So we really never measure at the plug level, how much electricity they were consuming. So we don't have real hardcore data, but we can probably get that. Well, now we cannot because now we have a control system that works much better. But we estimated basically, if you use six hours or three hours, what would be the percent of increase in terms of total energy consumption? If you consider you know, a standard you know, 1500 space heater. And it's significant. It's usually in the order, even if you use it only three hours, it's in the order of, you know, 5% or 4%, which is a significant chunk for being over and under conditioning and then the user trying to compensate for that. Yeah, hmm? Yes, stop? yes, people are not using the heaters anymore. So we demonstrated, you know, a learn and real-time method for utilizing user data to remove the PMB error. Occupancy, thermal comfort, and satisfaction greatly improve using real-time feedback. We show 67 and 80% satisfaction rates for our learn and real-time control strategies, respectively. And we improve comfort. We know improving comfort can potentially improve energy efficiency, although there is still a lot of work to be done. So this is what we have done. In terms of you know, future directions, I think I mentioned a couple of them. We want to integrate you know, predictive models of occupancy with predictive models of how people uh, may feel in terms of you know, comfort levels and combine them together with signals from a demand response system with you know, real time you know, gas and electricity prices. Uh, we have in the campus, we have a tremendous opportunity because we have local cogeneration. We have fuel cells, so we have PV, have you know, one megawatt plant solar. So that is feeding mostly this building. So I'm also working in other aspects of research in solar irradiance models, trying to predict you know, how will be you know, the load with respect to the electricity being produced and how much I need to buy from one ISO or one utility provider versus the local cogeneration. And you see, you have all these inputs together and you can create a big optimization problem to optimally solve the problem of you know, either minimizing energy savings subject to some constraint in terms of comfort or perhaps, you know, uh, arriving to a certain comfort level while minimizing energy or any combination that you want. We'll use that as our opportunity to thank Dr. Serpa. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much.
And, and given the time, I'm going to suggest that if you have questions, um, please feel free to come up and talk to Dr. Serpa individually. But I think we'll, we'll call this the end of this, this seminar. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs>